Welcome into the early line on Sports Grid. It is a Friday morning, and I'm Kevin Walsh, joined by Donnie Wright Side with a ton to get to. The first game of the preseason is in the books. How are we feeling, Donnie? Feeling good. Football Friday, officially. I think we can finally say here at the Sports Grid Network, we are ready for football season, and we did have football yesterday. At least, you know, hey, Kev. Turned it on for a little bit there. Had some fun. Saw you tweet out that you had some action on the game and profitable action. It's a good night all the way around. The job had to be done. The Hall of Fame game and that total absolutely was in the crosshairs. Ooh. The Raiders, though, carried the load. A 27-11 to 11 final for the Vegas Raiders. Their backfield was impressive. If you are keeping note, 33 carries, 159 yards, and three uh, rushing touchdowns as a team For the Vegas Raiders, Uh, the game goes over, and Vegas covered comfortably in this football game, Donnie. Yeah, I had a feeling that I tune in right around 8 o'clock here to sort of catch that opening kickoff, and I see bad weather. I'm like, isn't this what it's supposed to be about, K-Dub, having the opening game postponed because the weather is too Mm -hmm. bad? But they came out and played. Good performance overall because I thought the game was rather clean just watching it from a TV perspective. I enjoyed the first quarter let's just say so it's good to see football back in our lives Uh, the first play of the game was a 30 plus yard game that then involved a 15 yard roughing the passer penalty on number one overall pick Trevon Walker who had himself an interesting game I think for a lot of people we'll talk about some main takeaways from game number one of the NFL's preseason. We'll also talk about some other top NFL stories, and one for the Rams that is starting to, I think, go from a non-story to a little bit concerning. The idea around Matthew Stafford is that he absolutely is dealing with an elbow issue. It depends on who you are and who you're listening to, how serious this is, but some believe that this is bad elbow tendonitis for Matthew Stafford right now. Yeah, this isn't a good sign because how many times do we hear quarterbacks in camp get that camp arm, right? Which is why you bring in like five or six guys to throw passes, put him on a pitch count, he should be fine. But I thought I read somewhere, or at least saw on TV, where Sean McVay was saying, this is an abnormal injury here for a quarterback to have. Anytime I hear that already in training camp, knowing I got to go through 18 weeks of football coming up, that's never a good sign. So hopefully over the next couple of weeks, we'll get some information on the seriousness of this injury, or even if it is needs to be treated as a serious injury. We'll talk about the impact it might have on the Rams' odds and potential backup plans for the defending Super Bowl champions. In Pittsburgh, they have finalized their deal with Deontay Johnson, wondering when this would get done, and we didn't have to wait all too long. Two years, $27 million guaranteed, a touch under $40 million total for Deontay Johnson to stay with the Pittsburgh Steelers. Yeah, was this one of those moves, Kevin, where Deontay Johnson said, all right, I'm holding out for a lot of money. Now, hold on. I just went through three or four days at camp, and I watched the quarterbacks I'm going to play with. Give me anything you can give me right now, Steelers. I'll take it and sign on the dotted line. I feel like he should have gone the other direction if that was his plan of action, an awful one by Deontay Johnson. He should have said, look how bad they all are. I'm actually not playing here. Trade me, trade me, trade me which I think would have made some sense. But nevertheless, Deontay Johnson settled up now in Pittsburgh. Does this contract situation getting done have any impact on his outlook heading into the 2022 season? We will break that down. We'll also break down another wide receiver who is starting to gain a lot of hype from a Hall of Fame quarterback. First, we bring our radio audience into the fold right here on the early line. Kevin Walsh, Donnie Wright, Side, Sirius XM, Channel 159. Aaron Rodgers is out there starting the hype train for a rookie wide receiver. Now, you're probably thinking highly drafted Christian Watson has to be the uh, man catching Rodgers' attention. No, no, no. It's Romeo Dubes, fourth round selection out of Nevada. And everybody's saying, man, oh, man, we never see Rodgers talk like this about a rookie. And actually, people are believing it, DRS, as Dubes has gone from 100 to 1 to an NFL offensive rookie of the year to 50 to 1 to 40 to 1 to now this morning 26 to 1 All right, so we basically found our Jake Coomer out here for the 2022 NFL season where Aaron Rodgers can't live without this guy. Here's what I need to see from the Packers front office. Cut this guy. 
cut this guy in the next two weeks here just to fire up Aaron Rodgers one more time for the 2022 season as if he won't he can't go on Kevin unless this wide receiver is out there with him I love this this is almost like pumping up the stock market or pumping up a crypto coin right now what is Aaron Rodgers doing is he trying to deflate the market here Kevin but this is Aaron Rodgers to a core right here it is incredible, though, that they're essentially... Rodgers has never said a nice word about anybody. This kid must be the greatest wide receiver of all time. A lot of L.A. Bakes headlines here. We'll finish out the 7-7, seven and seven, including LeBron and the Lakers beginning the extension talks. Two years, $100 million, uh, roughly, it will be on the table for LeBron James. And the early reports are that these talks have been positive. We'll get into that and in some of the latest news on Kyrie Irving. We'll also talk about some Major League Baseball headlines, including Shohei Otani homering twice. One of seven home runs hit. For the Los Angeles Angels, all in a loss. That would be enough to drive somebody mad, talking about the Angels game. If you had that crystal ball out, Kevin, and go, you know what? I got a game for you. You're going to bet your team's going to hit seven home runs. Where do I sign up? Yeah, you take a loss. Seven solo shots. My goodness, get somebody on base out there. Incredible stuff. Speaking of loss, the Giants played the Dodgers yesterday, so you know they lost that game. Kershaw exited early, as we always say here on the show. Good thing he didn't go for that perfect game in April. We'll be right back. Your heart's racing. The clock's running out. It all comes down to this. We're talking pregame. 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 Get locked in with game time decisions. Your hosts, Gabe Marinci and Cam Stewart, will get you ready for game time. Everything you need to know before a game goes off the board with the best lips to back it up. Make your best bet with live odds updates, late breaking news, up to the minute injury reports, and real time analytics from inside the sports books. All the odds, all the action from sports wagering insiders and industry pros like Donnie Wrightside, Gam Lou, Cousin Sal, the Pro Football Doc, Dr. David Chow, and more. Get the winning edge every weekday afternoon from 6 to 7 p.m. Eastern, 3 to 4 Pacific. It's Game Time Decisions, only on Sports Grid. morning after as it pertains to this number for 30 and a half for an over under we have seen five unders in four over not the strongest trend or edge either which way but the last two games have gone under this number of 30 and a half last year the Steelers beat the Cowboys 16 to 3 we take the under out of principle tonight to start off a new year in football the sports grid network Pro Football Doc has found its new home right here with Sports Injury Central. And with that comes our expansion into other sports. Sports Injury Central will give you nonstop exclusive injury analysis from experienced team doctors from all three major sports. Doctors with resumes that include teams like the Chicago Bulls, the Texas Rangers, and the LA Chargers. So gain a fantasy DFS and betting edge right now for free at SICscore.com.
Back right here on the early line. Yesterday we had the NFL Hall of Fame game. The Vegas Raiders uh, handled this one pretty much start to finish here. A 27 to 11 final score led at the break 20 to nothing. Uh, the lone Jags touchdown came with under four minutes remaining. They went for a two point conversion, which you have to appreciate. Raiders cover again easily, and this game does go over the total. As far as big takeaways from this game specifically, I do think the story of the game to some degree was that total. The low number opening up at, you know, 33 and a half, maybe a 34 and a half, came all the way down to 29 and a half, pushed up just a hair, back to 30 and a hook. And for a little bit there, the game had landed at exactly 30. One, I guess, a, a nice reminder of just how sharp an NFL number uh, can be. But also, I, I think as we're going to have a lot of preseason football going into next week, don't automatically assume, oh, low number, everything's going to be under, under, under. These games can have relative juice. Trust me, we're not going to be talking about games during the regular season where there's 38 points scored and say, look at this over that we've cashed. Preseason's a different animal. I think just that was my, my quickest takeaway here from this game, Donnie. What about you? Yeah, impact performers, right? Who's the only impact performer that really played last night? It felt like was probably Josh Jacobs, five carries for 30 yards. Looked pretty good early on there. But I think the Raiders came out and said, let's just get physical and get that running game going and just set the tone, I guess you could say, for our preseason campaign. It was a nice performance by them, 27 to 11 overall. I don't take anything away from this game because, as we said, Kevin, who really played in this one? Like, you, you promote the game with Devontae Adams as your, you know, point man for ESPN. And, of course, Devontae Adams isn't going to play in this game. Neither their starting quarterbacks took case, and I guess it came down to here, and rightfully so. If you just bet this football game saying, all right, who has the better NFL talent, per se, from the quarterback position? It was the Vegas Raiders. Ah, Nick Mullins, he stinks, but he's been around. Jared Siddham stinks. Athletic guy, been around a little bit here, going up against Slaughter and Luton. That was the only matchup that you needed, almost like in Major League Baseball, Kevin. Just taking the better pitcher and saying, I'll live with it. That worked out last night, but you're correct here. It's kind of funny with under five minutes to go in the game, this number was teetering between 29 and a half and 30 and a half, and that game was exactly a 30 spot here coming down the stretch. And I was a little bit wrong yesterday, Kevin. 15 points in the fourth quarter yesterday, which means they scored two touchdowns. I thought it would have been one of those that third quarter, three to nothing. You'll get a lot more of that in the fourth quarter. You did. You got two touchdowns. So at least that was good for some of the backups to get some time. Yeah, I, I just thought that made a little bit more sense because it's not the same people that have been in the entire game of, all right, let's wrap this up and get out of here. It's fresh bodies. It's new bodies. And it's, you know, uh, kind of putting your your best foot forward to me there were two things I think you could look at there's a lot of talk about Josh McDaniels we'll get to him in a minute but Trayvon Walker played had a sack uh, uh, early for uh, the Jags there didn't play a ton and it made me just think about the defensive rookie of the year odds and if you look right now the favorite in this market is Kayvon Thibodeau at six to one tied with Aiden Hutchinson at six to one then it's Trayvon Walker at ten to one and Thibodeau and Hutch had a lot more juice to them throughout their collegiate careers, no doubt about it. But Walker did go first overall, and he looked very good here again, preseason, limited wraps, all those you know caveats apply. Uh, I understand that there. But a $4 gap between these guys. I, I just think to the NBA and the Summer League and the fact that you know Chet Holmgren and a half of basketball became the favorite, and then Paolo Bencaro took it back. It, it just... It's an interesting market, I think, to see here, Donnie. Will we see any movement throughout the you know preseason here in the NFL as it pertains to these rookie of the year markets because of guys jumping off of the screen? Yeah, it is. It's a, it's a pretty good, you know, cross-reference you brought up there because in the NBA, all we need to see is them jump ball, come down, hit a jump shot. Oh, my God, he's the best player in the NBA this year as a rookie after like 30 seconds. You're not getting that here from the NFL market. And quite frankly, opening up on national TV with getting plays in right away and a sack when the majority of the public were still watching in the first half, looks like he said, hey, probably going to be the favorite. Not so much. And also, we talk about the hypes coming out of training camp. To be honest with you, Kevin, turning on that game last night, they interviewed Doug Peterson before 
before the game. And my goodness, like back in Philadelphia, and you know, I had the you know thick head there of you know black hair. He's going all gray, which shows you the stressful life of an NFL coach here at this point. Talking about Trayvon Walker, yeah, you know, good mature kid, this and that. But we haven't heard the explosion plays, right? We haven't heard of oh my goodness, like the beat reporters in Jacksonville saying you just watch practice after five plays, Trayvon Walker is killing everybody. We didn't get that hype necessarily from the number one overall pick, but he had a good performance. And also, can I say this? You tune in right away. I pop the TV on. The kickoff's already there. I'm like, all right, let me sit back and watch. The first play was kind of crazy with the tip ball, 40-yard pass, and a roughing the pass. I'm like, ah, young kid doesn't know the rules. <sighs> Please, refs. Like, don't make this. The first thing I wanted to tweet in an NFL preseason game was after one play, the refs stink again. My goodness, Kev. Oh, well, they made sure we had a, a punt return. The poor fans Ugh. in attendance, it was the only thing they had some juice about, and they immediately made sure they got a flag out there. Uh, a punt return for a touchdown because they, like, they needed to make sure they set the stage for that at the minimum. Just so you know, you if get there's that a arm big loose. return, yeah. it's obviously coming back, which is always a bit of a headache. So that was the Trayvon Walker side. I thought it was impressive. Again, if, if you bet it's 10-1 to 1, entirely based on that game, that's surprising. But if you were emboldened by it, I wouldn't hold it against you. And the Vegas side, Josh McDaniels, Catching attention. Plays look good. Now, again, it's not the main stars of it all, so is this exactly how it's going to go? But I posed a question the other day, or last night, rather. Is McDaniels a top-five coach in the AFC? I just... We're going to get to some New England struggles in our number two that we're seeing kind of from their early camp reports. When you look at Josh McDaniels, Donnie, 20 to 1 to win NFL's Coach of the Year, landscape of the AFC, where does he fall for you? I mean, he's right up there. He really is. And you want to talk about some of the different conditions, I guess we could say, for, you know, the Romeo Cornells and, you know, moving on and Matt Patricia's. It just seems like every one of those assistant coaches doesn't seem to work out. And the reason why McDaniels also gets a bad rap is because, yes, he's a New England assistant coach for a long time, but he took the Colts job and then backed out right away. So it's almost like one of those enemy guys where we actually didn't think he would get another head coaching job because owners talk. This guy disrespected my organization, embarrassed us right here. We hired the guy. He backed out. Don't ever hire the game guy around. Now, you can't use that as collusion, but NFL owners typically stick together. So where, of course, would he land is with the Vegas Raiders. I'm high on Josh McDaniels. He's the, Even though he did have Tom Brady, and you could say that's you know the ultimate buoy, and you can move on from that, I get it. But he's a premier coordinator in the NFL, and he's got a lot of weapons to work with. It would not surprise me because if the Raiders have a good year, that means they're battling with the likes of the Chargers. They're battling with the likes of the Kansas City Chiefs. They're getting after it in the mix here possibly for that division, and that's going to be a strong point because the thing that we see a lot, Kevin, are the younger coaches, not necessarily in age, but being with those organizations where if they have a good season, they automatically get the flip of the cap here to the top of the heap at the FanDuel Sportsbook to be coach of the year. For me on McDaniels, in terms of where he ranks in the AFC, I asked the question, and then I think I quickly found the answer to be no. Reed, Tomlin, Vrabel, Harbaugh, Belichick, you're going to have to him in front of have to have him in front of at least one of those guys to get him inside your top five. And then there's a couple of other names that people w would make cases for between McDermott, uh, Doug Peterson has his Super Bowl. People love Frank Reich. AFC's got good coaches, but that doesn't matter. It's more about that Coach of the Year award. Here's, I think, the problem that McDaniels has. Because if you look at the uh, Coach of the Year award, it's a lot of guys in new locations. And then, of course, the ridiculous pricing of Brandon Staley. They're just making my life a lot easier. We'll be slandering him from pillar to post all season long because he's a horrific head coach and probably will be fired by the end of this season. But McDaniels is in a new place. And the idea probably is, hey, listen, if he can bring Vegas to the playoffs, they're projected to be the fourth best team in their division. That's a job well done. They were in the playoffs last year. So that's where McDaniels lands on a different scope. You look at the rest of these guys, right? Kevin O'Connell in uh, Minnesota brings the Vikings to the playoffs. That's got way more juice, right? If Nathaniel Hackett within the division goes to the playoffs with the Denver Broncos, that has more juice. I like the McDaniels hire. I think it, things went as well as they could in the preseason, but I don't know if you've really got value on him at 20-1. to 1. Though it's a much better that bet than Brandon Staley at 14. We'll be right back.
Sports Grid, your 24-7 sports wagering network. They played last game. The early line. Take a look at the top four seeds here in the Big Ten. They're going to play less. Aaron Rodgers and the, the morning Russell after. Wilson. We saw movement in the marketplace like Orlando. Fantasy Magic. Sports the Today. The Cavaliers are a little thin as well. Newswire. Minus 160 favorite on the money line today for Arizona. Pharrell and coast to ABG, coast. That's where they win cups. They win Stanley Cups over there. Give me the Game pass. time decision. Kind of bizarre when you consider it. Like, so everybody is out for the Warriors. In-game, live, I all like access. Mandy. I like Mandy against Bam. I think Mandy can win the game, take a corner. In-game, oh, live, oh, prime yeah, time. In-game, yes. live, overtime. All done before the final bet. Get the game. winning edge. Only on Sports Grid. The morning after. Saban's leadership ability and how the rest of us can learn from the greatest college football coach of all time. Uh, you know, one of the things that I love people tell me about in the book, you know, somebody described him, it's almost like he is a thoroughbred horse with blinders on. And so whatever he's <laughs> doing, he is locked into. He's not thinking about what other stuff he should be doing later on that night. He's doing what he needs to do. And I think that's really important. The Sports Grid Network. Fantasy Sports Today. Is there any reason to believe that Mariota will start at all for any fantasy team this season. So he is drafted on a Superflex, but you're talking once again. He's outside your top 22, 24, so he's that reserve guy. Or well, if you want to take a shot, you know, late on, maybe he becomes something. As I said, I think Ritt is going to play at some point. Most of us, uh, you know, ask anybody, they believe Falcons are going to be a bad team. Only on Sports Grid. Sports professor Rick Haro inside the $1.3 trillion business of sports with your daily numbers game inflation it hits cars it hits gas it hits food it hits all consumer expenditures why not sports espn did a poll among all of the leading concessionaires aramark levy delaware north and others to see how it actually impacts baseball and other concession sales well since 2021 to date hot dog prices food nachos beer up an average of 20 percent the most expensive hot dog, eight bucks thirty-three cents, for the Mariners. They're winning, so it may not matter. And hot dog prices continue to go up, not as much as gas prices, but something that is very important. So when we go to ball games and we look at ticket prices and parking, concessions becomes very, very important as well. We may see fan attendance decreasing, even if the revenue may go up slightly. We'll have to see as the summer plays out. Live right here on Sports Grid, taking a look at the Matthew Stafford situation. This is an interesting one. It could feel like a really, really huge story. It could feel like a whole lot of nothing. One thing I, I, I wanted to run to check was the odds for that opening game in L.A. I, I believe it was a minus one, and it's now a minus one and a half for the Buffalo Bills. If Stafford were all of the sudden to miss that game, you would know because that number would be very, very different than where it is. Again, the the concern levels range here. I, I think it's the position, obviously. It's the player that elevates this a lot, and it's the nature of the injury. Bad tendonitis for Stafford as they're just trying to monitor this. Ian Rappaport has said that he went over one of procedure over the summer, not a surgery, I guess hoping that that would kind of limit and uh, things and, and heal it and probably make it not much of a problem. But it's still a problem. And Stafford now is very likely going to be doing nothing, certainly in terms of throwing the football, for at least the next week. Again, these aren't positive reports, but I just can't tell how concerning they are at the moment. Where are you on this Matthew Sa Stafford story as we sit here on a Friday morning? 
Yeah, monitor mode at this point right now, because I don't know really what to believe or how serious the injury can be. But also, when you're taking a look at doing some backlogging here, it seems to be that this was an issue, Kevin, in the offseason. Cortisone shots, give it some rest, see if it'll heal at this point. And it turns up in training camp that it hasn't been healing, and it also is giving him a problem now, which means like, okay, let's take the next week, as you said, off or two weeks or really limit your throws here in the preseason. Now, granted. The guy's a veteran. It's not as if, like, hey, he really needs his reps, Kevin, or he's not going to be able to play football. That's not true. This guy could probably go the next two to three weeks with barely throwing footballs, show up in game one like nothing was ever wrong. And quite frankly, we used the, the one from last year, Dak Prescott with the Dallas Cowboys. What are we going to get out of his arm? It looked like he was rest, re refreshed, ready to go, winning an MVP that season after that first game, where, quite frankly, they probably should have beaten the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. But again, getting back to Max, Matt Stafford, he lives off his arm strength. I mean, this guy's the ultimate gunslinger. This is like the Brett Favre of the you know 21st century at this point, just letting it rip downfield. Big arm strength. I can beat you with my arm. And if there's any issues with that, doesn't said he start to check down. Hey, instead of throwing that deep out 15 yards, I'm going to dump it off to the back out of the backfield. It's not a good thing to start. It would have been different, Kevin, if this again was one of those, hey, just camp on. Shoulders just a little bit tired at this point. We're going to put him on a pitch count. He's going to throw no more than 30 passes a day. He'll be fine. But I'm starting to see some signals here that say, look, this might not just be a pain threshold thing. This might just be a damaged elbow at this point, similar to what a pitcher goes through. Whenever you hear in the pitching, you know, prospects here in Major League Baseball, hey, he's having some problems with his elbow. Does it ever actually get better? Seems like it doesn't. And the, the wonder for me is because Stafford is always kind of those one of those reliable guys. You expect him to be out there and, and grit things out. And if he did that in Detroit, he's going to do it for a legitimate Super Bowl contender here in L.A. Is there, Are we almost on track for him to play the first five games, right? We're wondering about it. And then he misses weeks six, seven, and eight. Because if that happens, your best bet is running to the window on under 4,500 and a half passing yards and under 34 and a half passing touchdowns. Those numbers are unchanged. We did Stafford versus Russell Wilson on Monday morning right here on the show. Those are unchanged numbers right now, which I thought was also interesting. Again, the concern level right now around Stafford does not seem to be largely shifting the markets against him or the Los Angeles Rams. So from that perspective, they're in a good spot. But again, it's trying to figure out, are people unworried or is there just a lack of movement? Have people not realized and therefore creating some value? Their odds to win the NFC 5-1, to one, a top three choice. To win their division, they are the favorite, though, at plus money, at plus 125. That win total checks in at 10.5 right now for the Los Angeles Rams. This is obviously your defending Super Bowl champions last year finished with a 12 and 5 record. When you see that 10 and a half, especially on the heels of this news, do you feel like uh, there's value either direction? I don't know, but if we're just looking at the number overall, right, we have to understand that we're in a new wave here in the NFL. We play 17 games, not 16 games. An 11 and 6, which would cash this ticket, that's not even a great year. That's a, that's a good year in the NFL for a team that you expect to make the playoffs, right? It wouldn't be shocking at the end of the season if you saw an 11-win Rams team. you say, wow, they actually had six losses this year. That's pretty incredible here because typically the teams that have those big numbers, like 13-3 and three back in the day when we had 16 games, 12-4 and four were unbelievable seasons, but 11-6 and six just rings like, hey, they did their average here. But also, let's take a look at some of the information that gets out for the Rams where why it might play into in under this season. And also maybe, maybe why it plays into an over. The reason I'm bringing this up is when you take a look at information, how it gets out in the NFL. To me, usually, if it's a bad injury, Sean McVay goes, that's just camp arm. Just can't, we're not worried about this at all. He's just going to be on a pitch count, no problem. It's kind of interesting where they're actually giving details out of what's actually going on inside of Matthew Stafford's elbow and exactly what the injury is and what they did in the offseason. Because so many times we just hear in the NFL that subterfuge where we're not going to give you any information that you need to use against us here. Case in point, just a couple years back, you remember Big Ben in the playoffs going to play the Denver Broncos? Uh, hurt his shoulder. He didn't throw a pass all week. So everybody's loading up on the Broncos going, he can't throw the football. How can they actually do anything on offense? Well, the first play of the game, Big Ben drops back, throws the ball 60 yards downfield like oh here we go the, you know 
cat and mouse type of game. Is that what's going on here for the Rams right now? Because they're letting out a lot more information that you usually hear when you don't have to give out any information in training camp. You're not on a week to week here. We have to report if a player is missing practice, how much time he has, is he probable, is he doubtful for this game? So based on the amount of information I'm getting from the Rams, I actually think this is a positive heading in towards the season. So right now, I'm not going to worry about it because usually if it was a serious injury, like you would see Ryan Jensen down for Tampa Bay, who we still don't know what's going on with his knee. Yeah, I'm going to sit this one out and say, you know what? Rams probably should be fine this year. Look, the, the Rams are a very, very talented football team. But pairing any type of concern on Stafford with their schedule makes me very hesitant on some of these numbers and put an eye towards their under. This is the Rams are the team, right? That if the schedule's there, they will obviously be favored. You would anticipate in all of their home games. They're not favored against Buffalo, but that is what it is. But favored in a chunk of road football games as well. Here is their road schedule. The division games you know, Arizona, San Fran, and Seattle. Here are their other road games, Donnie. Tampa Bay, New Orleans, Kansas City, Green Bay, and the Chargers. This is a team that is going to the very few list of teams where the Rams can't show up as a road favorite is who the Rams have on their schedule. So if all of a sudden you have to roll John Wofford out there, things start to feel a lot different. Where with Stafford, you're a two-point underdog. Now you're a seven-point underdog all of a sudden. And you kind of lose a lot of that breathing room. So here's the fascinating thing to me. If you're the Rams, you're willing to spend money. We know you don't care about draft picks. You maybe want to get yourself a little bit more of a backup plan, right? There's one team in the NFL that is waiting desperately on quarterback injury so they can finally trade an albatross of a contract that they don't want and at some point seemingly will have to cut. What do the San Francisco 49ers do if the Los Angeles Rams call on Jimmy Garoppolo? Is that the one team they actually wouldn't trade Jimmy G too? Would the Niners perhaps somehow, some way, beg teams across the NFL actually to trade for Garoppolo and the Niners would attach draft capital? That way Garoppolo then wouldn't be cut, find his way then to LA as their backup quarterback with the potential to start some games? Because again, if you're the San Francisco 49ers, who are not all that far back with the expectations of the defending Super Bowl champions, even if you've given up on Jimmy Garoppolo, which is the right move, you probably don't want him walking, though, in to your division with the Los Angeles Rams, the Seattle Seahawks, who cares? But if Garoppolo lands on the Rams, that's how you can stay afloat if you do miss out on a couple of Stafford starts. Yeah, how about this? Can you imagine this with the 49ers are so like hell bent on not letting the Rams get their quarterback that they need to maybe just, you know, wade through the waters of the first five to six weeks of the season? Would they actually keep Jimmy Garoppolo on the roster, deactivate and pay him $25 million just so he doesn't go to the Rams? That's a tough one for an owner to swallow at this point because you're right. When you say, all right, pick up the phone and call. Why would you trade in the division knowing that, let's just say, worst case scenario, Matthew Stafford. Hey, you know what? He's got to get surgery. Yeah, he might be out for the entire season at this point. All right, let's look for quarterbacks. Hey, you know what? We'd be willing to give you a third-round draft pick over here, 49ers, for Jimmy Garoppolo. He would never make that move because you're booing that team that you're playing against. Like, you would rather eat that and say, no. You're going to stink this year unless you make a trade for a better quarterback than Jimmy Garoppolo. We'll sit this one out. But you're right. You're supposed to make the best trade for the organization moving forward. But if Matthew Stafford, let's just say, is out for the season, which we don't think he will be, that's a fascinating thing where they pick up the phone and say, hey, what's it going to take to get Jimmy Garoppolo here so I can beat you with Jimmy Garoppolo and possibly still win this division? That would be a fun thing to see a play out. Don't think it will, but you're right. The 49ers calling everybody. We'll pay half the salary. Just don't let them get to the Rams. That is one of the rarest spots you could possibly put the Niners in. Because, again, the Rams might even be willing to offer some level of draft compensation. Now, I don't think because of the contract they will. And that's the thing is the Rams are probably sat there laughing. They're going to have to cut him any day now. 
and we'll just bring him into our mm-hmm. building. And maybe that's the landing spot for Jimmy Garoppolo. We spent so much time wondering about the Steelers and the Seahawks and the Panthers. He walks into the Super Bowl champions and get his, and gets his wish to play for the best play caller, second best play caller. We'll be right back. The morning after. Paige Beckers, a star in all of college hoops for UConn women's hoops, suffering a torn ACL in a pickup game. The program announced yesterday, and she will miss the entirety of this upcoming season. Suffering loss. Listen, going to the year, they had championship hopes after losing to South Carolina. I think South Carolina, with everybody back, is the clear favorite to repeat as the national champions. The Sports Grid Network. Maurice Allen, 2015-2016 European Long Drive Tour Champion, 2017 World Number One. Me personally, I keep my game face on me all the time. Especially coming out of the bunker, leaving the range, or even leaving the course. What's your story? The Bostonian versus the book. William Hill Caesars is 335. How is that that high? It was, and it was 330 this morning. Yeah, it's coming down. I did, did, it reached a point. People had enough. I mean, the bad guy said, give me this Colorado team. Like, the, yeah, again, to probably listen to the show. Hit the <laughs> like button if you come in and listen to the show and then go <laughs> bet the Colorado please. I mean, seriously. The Bostonian versus the book. The early line. You look at the the Soto statistics and that 246 batting average jumps off. He has the third best on base percentage in all of baseball. If he was having a better year with the stick, would be having a Barry Bonds level on base percentage right now. And that is going to, I really think, help Manny Machado get back into his group. Only on Sports Grid. Your heart's racing. The clock's running out. It all comes down to this. We're talking pregame. 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 Get locked in with game time decisions. Your hosts, Gabe Marinci and Cam Stewart, will get you ready for game time. Everything you need to know before a game goes off the board with the best lips to back it up. Make your best bet with live odds updates, late breaking news, up to the minute injury reports, and real time analytics from inside the sports books. All the odds, all the action from sports wagering insiders and industry pros like Donnie Wrightside, Gam Lou, Cousin Sal, the pro football doc, Dr. David Chow, and more. Get the winning edge every weekday afternoon from 6 to 7 p.m. Eastern, 3 to 4 Pacific. It's game time decisions only on Sports Grid. Major League Baseball yesterday continued to deliver a couple of things that. Uh, certainly caught my attention. I'm sure it caught yours as well, Donnie. Uh, the first, though, is the Clayton Kershaw uh, early exit against the San Francisco Giants. Look, let's get this part out of the way. Nobody on this show wants to see Kershaw injured. But can we all please just admit they should have kept him in in Minnesota? Like, is everybody okay now to admit that it was a ridiculous thing that he was taken out in that baseball game because... We were supposed to believe that this was going to save Clayton Kershaw's availability. A guy with his mileage put on at his age was always going to be injured throughout the season. So him leaving with only 80 pitches on the arm, again, two innings away from a lineup that looked like they had never ever seen a baseball before in their life from throwing a perfect game. That was a huge mistake. When we talk about Clayton Kershaw, for some people, 
a top five pitcher in the history of the sport, a clear first ballot Hall of Famer. To put a perfect game under the belt would have been magical. And again, Donnie, this is not the first time he has been injured this season. Can everybody just admit they should have let Kershaw go for the perfect game? Well, Kevin, if they let him go for the perfect game, he never would have made it to August 5th, 2022 at this point. That's the whole point about it here. And if you do save those innings, and maybe now they'll say, okay, you know what? The back injury, this is perfect timing because he doesn't have to pitch through August or September, and he can be fresh for the playoffs and see what we can have. I always thought it was quite a joke there where, you know, and good on Kershaw, who is a veteran guy, backing up his manager instead of saying, like, most pitchers, yeah, I, I told. I mean, this is the most stupid. I'm going chasing history here. Let me go out and get this. If I don't throw another pitch in Major League Baseball and I threw a perfect game, I'll live with that because I already had my World Series, Cy Young Awards, whatever, and we'll go down that path. But you're right about that. For the Dodgers to be saving up their pitching staff in April only to know exactly Kershaw is going to be broken down anyway during the season, it was pretty comical to watch. Now, with that mini victory lap in our back pocket, Injuries are popping up a little bit more than you would want if you're the Los Angeles Dodgers. In the current rotation, Tony Gonsolin, Tyler Anderson, Julio Urias, Andrew Heaney. This is, remember the Dodgers rotation we were working with last year? Max Scherzer, Walker Bueller, Clayton Kershaw. It just, it, it just, it felt very different to me, the Dodgers. Now, with all of that, they're 72 and 33. They're baseball's best team. Again, because they always are. And the anticipation is guys will come back. But is there any fear that injuries could derail what the Dodgers have going on? Because I got to tell you, they were a lot quieter at the deadline than I would have anticipated. I thought they would have tried to find a way to swing for a big arm. Carlos Rodon probably wasn't really in the cards for them. But Louis Castillo or Frankie Montas, whatever it might have been, they didn't really seem to push the envelope in that way in L.A. And and again, I'm sure to some degree it's because they're confident guys returning, but the Yankees have jumped in front of the Dodgers once again for the World Series favorite status. And I think that has to do with the fact that the injury bug does seem to keep on touching this Dodgers rotation. No, it does. And also, there, there's two different equations you can look at here because the Dodgers are so talented and so deep that in the regular season, Kevin, I don't think it's going to matter all that much. They'll win their large majority of games they play just because they can throw a decent pitcher on the mound, have a good bullpen, and that one through nine in the lineup will just continue to hit like they've been doing there. So now if we're trying to equate it, though, moving in from the regular season to the playoffs, this is where you get in trouble because they are expecting Walker Buell to come back. But how many times do you see a pitcher with an L bow injury come back and be just as strong and maybe not even have any issues down the stretch so let's say you head into the playoffs Kershaw is a shell of his former self just trying to battle through injuries Walker Bueller never comes back and you're playing the Mets who are going to line up with Max Scherzer and Jacob deGrom one two in that series and probably have those guys if it's a long series at least pitch another two times through the rotation which would be incredible so you'd have deGrom with two starts Scherzer Mm -hmm. with two starts going up against what, Tony Gonsolin? Is he some sort of playoff maven at this point is going to save the day? That's the issue you run into. Regular season, the Dodgers won't panic. Quite frankly, they're probably going to finish with the best record, whether or not Kershaw or Bueller comes back in the regular season. But postseason, that's where you can get in trouble, where a DeGrom or a Scherzer can go seven or eight innings, and there's nothing you can do about it because you can't counter punch with Walker Bueller or a healthy Clayton Kershaw. Again, this is why I've pick the Mets to win the World Series. But it's not just the Mets. It's about feeling like you're on a a level playing field. Musgrove, you Darvish? If you're the Padres, I think you take that as your front two, right? And and, and the, the Brewers and the Braves, like they will feel competitive with their front end pitching. It makes for an interesting set of circumstances in the National League, no doubt about it. We'll get to the Mets in just a minute, but I want to talk about Otani quickly. He hit two home runs yesterday, and this is, without a shadow of a doubt, the first time that Otani has had a multi-home run game, and it meant absolutely nothing. And you might be like, oh, come on, that's harsh. I'm not giving you an opinion. His odds didn't move for AL MVP yesterday. That is incredible to me, that Otani had a multi-home run game, 
and it meant nothing to the market. Yesterday, I asked after he had lost to the athletics, are we done here? Is this over? And it kind of feels like we are. And again, wins and losses have not mattered largely to the MVP market in Major League Baseball. But there is something about these angels that I think is might specifically hurt Shohei Otani. Because I think one of baseball's big narratives is that the Angels are a disaster. Like, as much as Otani is spectacular and we love Mike Trout, even though now he's injured, it's, it's that the Angels are a nightmare. You know, there's that famous tweet that goes viral once a week, once every two weeks about every single time I look at an Angels box score, Otani and Trout did something that's never happened since 1905 and the Angels found a way to lose to the Detroit Tigers. They had seven home runs yesterday and lost to the Oakland Athletics at home. That can't happen, but it does because they're terrible. And that, to me, am I off base here? But I might, if somebody says, what is the big story of the Angels season? At this rate, I really don't think it's how good Otani is. I think it's how bad they are and that they were taking phone calls on Otani at the deadline because of how bad they are. When you're heading down the stretch, and again, I use the term extra credit here, the Yankees are going to play in big ball games. Judge has the chance to shine in those big ball games. You look at the Los Angeles Angels, they're 24 games back. We just started August. We have basically two months left in the season. They could be as much as 30 games back. So how much of an MVP candidate can you be by playing in a ballpark that's semi-empty every night, zero juice, because it doesn't matter if you win or lose. And you're right. Sometimes we just take a look at the individualized you know, parts of Major League Baseball. You can only control what you can. I'm on the mound, the pitching. I could throw nine shutout innings, but my team might not be able to get any hits. Or if you're at the plate for Shohei Otani, I can hit two home runs yesterday and we still lose. There's no juice left in these games. We're watching Yankee games because they're going to be battling with, let's just say, you know, coming down the stretch with the Astros, or quite frankly, we think they might win the World Series. They're going to be playing in that environment in big baseball games in the Bronx. And if Aaron Jones, excuse me, Aaron Judge hits a home run, that's going to be a positive. And you're right. You saw two home runs yesterday from Shohei Otani. Didn't even move the Richter scale one bit here. Usually when you see a two-home run game by one of these guys, you're going right to the FanDuel Sportsbook and you're checking that odd shift. But everybody is so checked out on the Angels, it's also going to be Aaron, jo Aaron Judge to win? Not necessarily. It's his to lose now. What does he have to do? Hit 107 the rest of the way. The Yankees fall out of first place in the AL East, which would be a disaster. What actually has to happen for Otani to get back in? Nothing short of throwing two no-hitters over the final 60 days and hitting and surpassing Aaron Judge in the home run race, which we know isn't going to happen. That's what it feels like those odds are stacking up of why Aaron Judge now is a minus 420 favorite. I know it sounds crazy. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't even know if there's anything Otani can do. I know we have a decent chunk of baseball left, right? About 50 games or so, but the Angels are in such a bad spot. Unless injury checks in, we really might be done here. Something that we will certainly continue to follow, no doubt about it. How about the Mets, though, Nani? Remember when the Mets walked into Atlanta? before the All-Star break and their season was about to collapse mm -hmm. right before their eyes. Every single Mets fan in complete disarray. What are we going to do? Max Scherzer booked as a dog. They won the series. Took two out of three. And now by the time we get here to this series against the Braves again, the Mets are the home team. They took the first game. And they sit as a four and a half game advantage over the Braves and a minus 300 favorite on the FanDuel Sportsbook. I really, you know, and again, I understand being certainly where I'm from and you're in close enough proximity and obviously follow the sport. Anybody does, I guess, proximity to understand why Mets fans have a level of doom and gloom about them. But can we please, as this team has sat here winning nine of their last 10, averaging nearly six runs per game over that span, can we please acknowledge that these are not the doom and gloom Mets this is a very, very good baseball team that checks more boxes than most Mets groups of the past. While DeGrom and Scherzer 
will, when we get to the postseason, be the story of this team. While Edwin Diaz deserves every flower that he could possibly get with a two-inning, six-out save last night and a fantastic job all season long. This is also a team with Pete Alonso, who is flirting with an RBI crown, a Francisco Lindor who has popped off, an all-star in Jeff McNeil, an all-star in Starling Marte. This is a very, very good baseball team, and it doesn't matter to me whether they win this division or not, but the truth of it is they're minus 300 to do so because they are a very, very good baseball team who they should not be viewing through this doom and gloom lens anymore. We talk about like getting over the hump and getting momentum, right? You saw the Mets, roughly a 10-game lead. Looked like they're going to run and hide the rest of the summer and into the fall here in the NL East. And then you saw the falling apart of the Mets, the injuries that are taking place, the Atlanta Braves getting hot. And we talked about that series, right? There could be a chance at the end of the series that the Braves are in first place in the NL East, and it didn't happen here. So now you're seeing the reverse now. You held off that stampede coming from the Braves. Now you're increasing your lead and beating them head-to-head with a four-and-a-half game lead. You're now surging here at the FanDuel Sportsbook to a minus 300 to win the division. It's one of those things that, hey, we held them off. We never gave up our lead, and now we're extending it. It would have been very interesting to watch before the All-Star break if they actually had given up that lead and the Atlanta Braves took control. Maybe they were running hot. It's good to see for the Mets and also getting some resilience here. How many times do we talk about those competitive games that you're going to play or not play down the stretch in September? If you're up 15 games in your division, you're not playing any meaningful baseball, Kevin, over the final three weeks of the season. Maybe you're not as sharp as you need to be to the playoffs. That's nice to get that charge from the Atlanta Braves, hold them off, and still playing your best baseball at this time. Good move for the Mets. They're in a pretty good spot here in early August. No doubt about it. They should feel very good about themselves right now. And, you know, part of the reason that they're in this spot is they've been beating up on that division. They are 34-13 and 13 versus the East. This is just a now, – now, that might include the American League side. But, again, the Mets have just been very, very solid in that respect. We'll be right back. We close out our number one. Sports Grid, your 24-7 sports wagering network. People are going to the betting window betting and betting them the now rim. before the trade takes place. How Diamond dare bets. they do what's fiscally responsible? Let's see how it plays out. Buffalo's going all in right Football now. Football full football. circle. All their chips in the middle of the table. It's do or die for And Godwin being out. They, they've had a little bit of a shakeup. In-game live all access. You could take the points. You can take the money line. And we have to go to San Jose, too. Maybe a small play on San Jose. I'm going to go both underdogs here. I don't want to hear it anymore. Wow. In game live. Prime time. He plays time. like he did in game five. They are going to be all good in game six at home. Well, boy, you want to give the eight and a half points with a desperate team facing elimination. Get the winning edge. Only on Sports Grid, your 24 7 sports wagering network. The early line. Even though it was an independent arbitrator that the NFL and the NFLPA said was going to be okay, we'll abide by this decision. But it comes down to Roger Goodell is the end-all, be-all on you know punishments here in the NFL. And he's going to strike that anvil. And quite frankly, he should. So the lose-lose situation is if you give Deshaun a 12-game suspension or a 17-game suspension, it's still a stain on the NFL. Only on Sports Grid. <laughs> Sports professor Rick Harrow into the $1.3 trillion business of sports with your daily numbers game. Finally, Cooperstown and Major League Baseball have something specific and voluminous to celebrate. Seven worthy Hall of Fame members 
led by David Ortiz. Number 34 joins his Dominican friends, Guerrero, uh, Marichal, uh, others. The most important issue for him is not just he's the first DH to be elected on the first ballot of the Hall of Fame, and frankly, his last season. Take a look at it. 127 RBIs and a uh, 38 homers, the biggest last season in history. Even more important than that, his civic mindedness, the rallying of Boston Strong, and all of the things that we took for granted. But here's the issue steroids, no steroids, that took a back seat to doing good, philanthropic, absolute positivity. Baseball needs it now more than ever. Sports professor Rick Harrow, Daily Numbers Game. Closing out hour number one with a look towards Justin Verlander, who yesterday continued his fantastic season, 15 and three record, the best in baseball, a 173 ERA, the best in baseball as well, and has now flipped to a minus money favorite for AL Cy Young on the FanDuel Sportsbook, minus 130 to Shane McClanahan's plus 260. Dylan Cease, not all too far back, under 5-1. to one. Everybody else is 23-1 to one or longer. Justin Verlander starting to create some separation here from the field with a scoreless outing yesterday. Are you buying in that Verlander is going to be able to hold serve here and stay minus money the rest of the way? I do, because again, extra credit comes in here, Kevin. What are you taking a look at here? Does Shane McClanahan and the Tampa Bay Rays have a chance to win their division? No, they don't. That's the Yankees' division. You take a look at the Houston Astros here. Are they going to win their division? Probably so. So Justin Verlander gets a kick up in that environment, but also meaningful games down the stretch. You're going to see the Astros needing to win to try to take down the New York Yankees as the number one overall seed. Verlander's going to pitch a majority of these games coming down the stretch, and I expect him to be just as dominant as he's been here. So that minus 130, and it wasn't too long ago where Shane McClanahan looked like he was the shoe-in to be the Cy Young Award-winning pitcher here in the American League. Good on Justin Verlander here. Minus 130, absolutely deserving to be in that front-runner position. The reality is at the break, McClanahan, all of the advanced numbers pointed towards him, and he was the favorite in the market. And then his first outing against Baltimore was solid. Seven innings, two earned runs, you live with that. He set a bar for himself where maybe that was a touch disappointing, but it was fine, right? It did actually raise his his ERA, that seven innings of work with two earned runs. But it was the next outing. Four and a third, seven hits, five earned runs. Now his ERA sits above a two. And again, a Verlander is a one seven three. Now McClanahan actually does lead baseball in whip, but that's not going to be enough to counteract a lot of the things that are in Verlander's favor. McClanahan's going to have to go on a run, but above all else, he's going to need Verlander to get hit and maybe a couple of times, which doesn't feel like it. We'll be right back. Hour number two is next. 